Okay, I would like to thank all of our panelists for speaking today. We will have a few minutes for questions. Um, they would like you to, to, to line up over here so that um, they can hear you on, on C-SPAN. <laughs> peer reviewing that uh, undergirds science in so many ways and has served science well for so many centuries. I'm wondering also about the world that's evolving of blogging, whether or not there will be some clashes between blogging as a form of scientific communication, uh, the release of scientific information, and the more systematic form of peer reviewing with its blind uh, of reviewing channels. I think we can leave that to these two who are okay, actual well, scientists. Well, that actually, I'll, yeah, I'll take some, I'll have some too, but no, you, you can. Okay, well, I mean, I, I think blogs are inherently peer reviewed. You know, you put it out there and anyone else can link to you and, and write up, you know, why you're wrong in, you know, a lot more space than you have in, in a peer reviewed article. Um, you know, and peer review kind of goes on behind the scenes, whereas with a blog, when somebody tells you you're wrong, it's out there for everyone to read. So, I mean, at least when, you know, when I write about science, I stick to my field. I, you know, carefully write my articles so that I know that, you know, I, I can't get caught up somewhere. So, um, so I, I think it's it's still peer reviewed. It's just a different form. I avoid that by never being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you go. You know, peer review is, among other things, extremely slow process as formally practiced by the scientific community. And sometimes people, policymakers, the members of the public want to know uh, faster then the peer review process happens. Actually, was the case with hurricanes, global warming, two studies getting huge amounts of attention, and then very little follow-up because so everybody wanted to publish a study on this topic once those came out, and they all went very slowly through the peer review process. So blogs became the number one place for slicing and dicing the information, including expert blogs like realclimate.org and others where extremely high-level conversations were going on between scientists, including the original authors about this research. So in some cases, blogs are the place because journals are so slow. I'm wondering about the anonymity uh, question. With blind peer reviewing, people can make critiques without having their careers ruined or whatever. With blogging, there's the temptation to yeah. even conduct flame wars or something along those well, lines. You can, you can do it anonymously, too. Anonymous. There are anonymous comments on blogs all the time. People use nicknames that you know don't reflect who they are. And I so. think also that there's this idea that blogging needs to replace something, but it doesn't. I mean, there still is peer review. There still are journals. Uh, in physics, we put all of our papers online before we get them refereed. Anyone can read them, but then we also get them refereed, so they appear in a journal, and that's been uh, the stamp of approval been placed on that by the scientific community. And blogs are just a completely extra thing, a new way to have a conversation, a new way to see what is going on in between the papers that I think just makes uh, the whole process more transparent. Hi, I'm from central New Jersey, and I actually was on a school board. I ran. I, uh, you're right, it costs about $400. I came in first. Um, so I have a few comments about how uh, the religious right uh, reacts in school boards because I've had firsthand experience with it. Um, I found in the past that sometimes school boards and particularly school administration um, officials can sometimes exacerbate the problem because they tend to be a little bit haughty, a little bit um, proud of how their, their experience and their professionalism. And especially back in the 90s when I was on the school board, um, they, they thought they needed to teach values, and I think a lot of the religious light, right objected to that. I come from a very fundamentalist evangelical family, so I had some insight to this, so I spoke to these people who came to the board meetings. They didn't want schools to be teaching values, and that's the first thing. Um, one of the, an incident that happened on my school board is we had a diversity day that everybody had to attend. It was mandatory. We had an AIDS activist who led a discussion with um, recitation of, the, of an F-bomb. Um, and she, put, she demonstrated how to put a condom on a purple dildo with her mouth. Okay, That turned out the religious right. These are the kinds of things that get religious right to your school board meetings. And the more you push things like that, the more you're going to drive their anger. So I found that through my own family that I tried to approach this evolution through an explanation of natural selection. So I, I look for things that they might be familiar with, like cancer, hybrid tea roses, 
things like that they can identify with. And then I try to explain how natural selection works, and that has seemed to gotten through to them. So those are my comments. All right. Um, given that there's 100 billion galaxies in the universe, it's hard for me to believe that there's a, not another life form within one of those galaxies. So do um, most scientists or majority um, think that they're going to find a sort of life form someday or believe that there is some form out there? Well, that's a really good question, and the answer is we don't know. And it's not that we basically know but are too cautious to say anything. We honestly just don't know. I mean, one thing is that the fact that it is hard to believe has no value whatsoever in judging whether or not it's true. Uh, when we're trying to figure out the total number of, let's say, intelligent civilizations in the universe, you take the total number of planetary systems, which is big, and you multiply by the fraction of planetary systems that have intelligent civilizations, which we have no idea what that number is. It could be 10 to the minus 100, in which case there are, there's nothing but us. So we're looking. Different people have their different individual opinions, but it's just a matter of waiting to see. We have no way right now of predicting what that number could possibly be. Hi, this question is for Chris Mooney. I'm from New Orleans, too, by the way. Um, first, I want to thank you. I appreciated your kind of nuanced take on the uh, climate change science, because a lot of what we get tends to be either their supporters, their deniers, and that's pretty much the entire debate. But speaking of this gray area, which I find a bit more interesting because of the complexity, I would be interested to hear your opinions on the very public fallout between Dr. Christopher Lancey and the IPCC. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the situation. Do you? Do you feel he had a legitimate point that his research was being misrepresented, or do you feel that he overreacted and maybe lost the opportunity to present his point? Um, well, first of all, his argument wasn't that his research was being misrepresented. His argument was that um, Kevin Trenberth, who is another scientist um, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, had a high position in the IPCC, and that he was, I, I forget the exact title, but some kind of lead author on the report that Lancey would be contributing to, and Trenberth had went and, and gone and made statements about hurricanes and global warming following the destruction in Florida in 2004 that Lancey didn't think were scientifically defensible. And so Lancey said, I don't think the IPCC can do a fair job adjudicating um, with Tre Trenberth in charge, and therefore I'm going to resign. It was very public. Uh, and this was one of the many spats between these groups of scientists that I didn't cover, although I do a chapter on it in the book. I mean, there's, there's arguments both ways. If you believe someone is biased, and I'm not going to say that I believe that, but Lancey clearly did, then you can see why. But on the other hand, there's a good argument for going through the process, and then you have a stronger grievance at the end if you can go through the process and say, I tried to make these counter arguments and they didn't listen to me instead of saying, no, they're just not going to listen to me. So a lot of people pointed that out, that it would have been better. But this is this was used as a kind of club to beat the IPCC over the head with. Um, and actually, it hasn't flamed up again, although now the IPCC is out. And I guess um, Lancey wasn't too angry if he was. He, he, I was waiting to hear from him um, to see what he thought of the final report, which says it's more likely than not that hurricanes have intensified because of global warming. So the confidence is slightly more than 50 percent in the conclusion. I don't know if Lancey would agree with that. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah it's one of many fights between these, this group of scientists, and it's driven by the fact that the hurricane people have been doing this for a long time, and suddenly the climate people, like Trenberth, it's a hot topic, and the climate people are really interested, and they have different methods, different approaches, and it's, it becomes a bit of a turf battle between them, I think. Right.